Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Brooklyn's, and as ever, thank you for being here, and thank you for supporting the Trust. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Steve Clark, and it's a pleasure to organise and host these series of events. Um, a special welcome to our non-members that are here this evening. I hope you enjoy the evening, and you'll take some time to come back to us in the future. I don't mind admitting we're uh, in good company tonight, and we have a number of people that I'm sure Simon may wish to talk to during the evening. Uh, I can also say that Helden will be signing some of his books later on, so if you're interested in buying and signing, now is the time. I'm always delighted when we get to this point in the evening. The guests are here, the speakers are here, the AV system's working perfectly. Put a few pennies in the meter, and of course, you're here, which is the main reason that we are here. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any more delay, will you please welcome Howden and Simon Taylor. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to have you back for another of our little motor racing legends evenings. Now usually these evenings uh, we've celebrated a great racing driver, sometimes we've celebrated a great uh, racing car designer. Tonight we've got a bit of a problem because we've got about an hour and a half I think before we get thrown out and we've got a man here who has been of course a Formula One driver for Williams and for BRM He's also a man who was virtually a founder member of the great McLaren organization. Uh, he has also been a motor race ma manufacturer. He has designed and built his own racing cars with such success that I think 400 of them were made. And Howden reckons that he then was able to sell on bits for another 400, and that's really where the profit was. <laughs> He's been a director and indeed president of the BRDC. He's also, amazingly, been a journalist. I don't quite know where he fitted that in. It makes me feel very humble. Um, I'm a journalist who's never been a Formula One driver. Um, and he's now become a book publisher as well. He now runs his own motor racing book uh, publishing company. So he is a pretty Catholic fellow. And if you look up here, we're going to see some photographs that he's brought along. And Harden, I think this is a pretty exceptional way to start. You here have a team of four people in what we could say is the first Tiger, because it's a car you built. Yeah, this is uh, me. Uh... I'm the big one in the front because I'm the eldest and these are my three brothers. There's a sister who didn't actually make the photo, but um, <coughs> I've actually learned a little bit more about designing cars since we did this. <laughs> now we all know, <coughs> like Bruce McLaren, like Denny Hull, like Chris Amon, three other great Formula One drivers, you are a New Zealander. And what we're always told is that New Zealanders, because they live a very long way away from everybody else, and it's quite difficult for them to get hold of the nice bits and pieces that rich young men can get this side of the world, you have to make things yourself. Now, I think if we... I haven't got a button to move on the... Um, Simon, it's on the uh, table. Oh, I have. Thank you very much. Because that was a car that you built, but let's move on if I can. There we go. But those are some boats which Harden also got involved with, but we're going to move on to see, yes. Now here is a fine racing car. That's perhaps the second Tiger, isn't it? Tell us, you built that yourself age what? Uh, 14. Uh, yeah, when I first became interested in racing, and um, I thought I'd need a little racing car. I obviously couldn't have a license at that age, but uh, I scratch together a whole bunch of materials from scrap yards and things and an old steering box off a 32 Chevy and got a, uh, a water pump uh, motor there and some wheelbarrow wheels 
and we need to do about 30 miles an hour. How long did it take you to build? Oh, you know, it took me just about a year to build because I had really no facilities. Um, and so I used to run it around the roads at the local yacht club, of which I was a member, but uh, when there was nobody there, that was my racetrack. Well, you then graduated to a buckler. That, I think, was the first car you raced on a grown-up circuit. Yeah, my father had been driving the car for the owner, as my father, with a cap and a piece of rag in his hand. And uh, he did pretty well for this guy. We happened to be at this race meeting, and father said, no, I can help have a little run afterwards. I still didn't have a license. Uh, and these are my two brothers on the left. So, uh, yeah, I got three laps in this car, and that was probably my first drive of what you would say was a proper racing car, sort of. Well, we'll move on, because this is certainly a proper racing car, a Lotus 11, with you at the wheel. Now, that can't have been an inexpensive machine for, what, were you 19 at this stage? I think it was 18, 18. I thought it, yeah. Well, uh, I raced my mother's Morris Minor at a couple of events and did fairly well, so I just knew then I was a star. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what I really needed was a proper racing car, and there was this one Lotus 11 in New Zealand, uh, which was for sale for 1,300 pounds, because we had pounds in those days in New Zealand, and I managed to scratch up 650, so now I've got to find the other 650. And uh, so I wheedled away at my mother, and she loaned me the other 650 at a suitable rate of interest. And so I bought the car, but at which point I had no money. I managed just to make it to the first big race meeting at Ardmore, the New Zealand Grand Prix meeting, January. And uh, there was a New Zealand only race there that I went into, and I won it, and it paid 150 pounds. So, oh, Suddenly, I got my running money. Professional racing driver, so Yeah, oh, well, and I'd also, in the other sports car race during the day, I won 15 pounds for a class win. So I had 165 pounds at the end of the day. And my mother said, oh, this is good. You could probably make a living at doing this. So <laughs> here I was. All right. Well, <laughs> we're now, um, we've now leapt to Europe. So let's just hold on to the picture for a moment. You came. Uh, to England aged 20, I think? Yes, correct. And you had 25 pounds in your pocket because you'd spent all your money in New Zealand. What was the route that you took to get from New Zealand to Hounslow or wherever you ended up? Uh, Earl's Court Road. Earl's Court. Uh, yeah, well, uh, in those days there was a thing called the Overseas Visitors Club, I don't know if it still goes, and for about 65 pounds they would get you from Auckland to Earl's Court Road. So, and it, luckily, uh, unlucky depending on who you are, my grandfather had not long since died, and when his fortune trickled down, 65 pounds approximately landed in my lap. So I thought, right, right I can get to England now. Um, I had planned to sell the Lotus and arrive with a chunk of money probably just as well I didn't in hindsight, but uh, so when I got here, because the loader site crashed and my father fixed it, repaired it, sold it on and netted 650 pounds plus the interest which he handed to my mother, so I was quite <laughs> down. And uh, so yeah, I, I had invested in some shares earlier, so I had to sell on that. I say, got here with 25 pounds, which wasn't quite enough to buy a Formula One drive, but <laughs> well, starting somewhere. I may say, ladies and gentlemen, that on that uh, table are some volumes of the book that Harden has written about his life. Unlike an awful lot of books that you can buy about racing drivers' lives, Harden actually wrote this one himself. So many of them are bland and tell you nothing you don't already know, because they're written by ghostwriters. Harden has told his story. In my line of work, you end up reading an awful lot of books. You get sent one or two a week, and most of them tell you nothing you don't already know. I can thoroughly recommend that book, and although we're going to have to move tonight rather quickly over Harden's extraordinary half-century, 
um, in motorsport, read the book and you'll be able to get some of the details that we haven't got to. I mean, there's no time to say how Harden ended up in that car at the Nürburgring. That is a Formula Junior gentleman. Formula Junior, 1963, uh, that was one of the works cars that uh, Graham Warren sent the team to George Henrod. And I went there as a mechanic. Um, and one day, uh, I was given a run at, at Brands Hatch because they had to run the engine. They didn't have a dyno, so Johnny Muller, my other Kiwi mate, rebuilt the engine. We went to Brands on Wednesday afternoon, you know, when the butcher and the baker, the candlestick maker, all used to turn out in their delivery vans and things. So we ran around there, and I, the owner was impressed with how quick I went. And uh, so he said, uh, oh, well, you can be the number two driver now, as well as being mechanic. And, uh, <laughs> but you can't start till after the next race. So at the next race, the number one driver crashed and broke his leg, Roy Pike, and uh, the other car got shunted. So I'd suddenly gone from the number two driver to the number one driver, but all I had to do was get the car rebuilt. And so we didn't sleep for about a week, and then I had my first race, and then I went to Nürburgring and Brands Hatch. But at the end of the year, Esso, who was the sponsor, said, we've got another Formula One team to sponsor because Brabham's had come along and so no more German. That all came to a, came to a halt. Yeah. But now we have to come to perhaps the first key uh, happening in your extraordinary career. New Zealand is sticking together. You got a phone call I think from Ian Young, journalist whom you knew from way back and he said I've got a man here that wants to speak to you. And the man on the phone was the man on the left of this picture. Tell us about this picture. Well, yeah, so I got the call. Bruce said, I'm expanding my team and uh, I want to hire another Kiwi. He already had one, Wal Wilmot. And so I joined up and uh, they had the Xerox special then that had been at the altar we put in. But Bruce was obviously determined to build his own car. This is the M1. The, uh, the wind tunnel model, and uh, we built that at the end, at late 64. And um, tell us who's in the picture. Oh, so okay, left is Bruce, then Wal Wilmot, who had been Bruce's mechanic uh, when he drove for Tommy Atkins. They got Bruce Harry, uh, who was the mate of Chris Amon, and then you got me, and then Ian Young, the uh, journalist. So there's all Kiwis there. So McLaren, you were absolutely in at the bottom. There is the completed McLaren M1, looking pretty good. Yes, beautiful little car, really. Yeah, but lovely. That was quite rapidly followed by a car which was styled by a man who's in this room, and a man who actually styled the famous Bruce McLaren badge. So Michael Turner's here. Stand up, Michael, and give us all a little wave. Here is Michael Turner, the famous. that surprised that he designed that famous badge. What you would maybe be more surprised about was that he actually styled the second McLaren. That is Michael Turner's original sketch and this is how the car turned out. <coughs> Pretty much identical. Was it a good car? It was a good car. The, the M1A, which was the first production car, which was derived from the M1 we saw there, had a lot of lift, it wasn't the greatest body in the world, and so Michael, presumably you're an aerodynamicist, Michael, and so he came and, and redid the whole front end, and it was a, it was a huge improvement. Mm. The chassis itself was basically the same, and it used the same automobile engine, but the bodywork was much better. In the picture here is Tyler Alexander in the white coat, Teddy Mayer, Charlie Scarano, and then old Nobby, the bodybuilder. Alloy bottom. Just tell us briefly what was the very first McLaren factory in heavy inverted commas? Where, where did you work when you first became, well I mean you were the fifth including Bruce weren't you? Including Bruce you were number five of the five man team. Uh, well it was Bruce and Patty were the, uh, were the directors, Ian Young was the secretary 
And then there was Wal Wilmot, Tyler Alexander, who had come with Teddy Mayer, and then I was the third of the guys on the shop floor. And they had this little place in New Malden, which was a contractor's place, kept his earth moving equipment there. And Bruce was going to buy it. And so it was an area, well, it was about uh, at least twice the size of this stage. There was <laughs> maybe a bit more, and there was just enough room for the Xerox special, one of the Tasman Coopers, a workbench, a set of welding bottles, a vice, and that was it. Um, it was pretty grubby. It, the floor had been concrete, but the earth moving machines had kind of broken it up, so it was basically dirt. And we were there for, I suppose, about three months and then realized this was not the place. So Ian found a place in Feltham and we moved out of the grubby old earth moving place. What do you think Bruce would think if he could see the kind of glass and stainless steel palace that McLaren occupy now? Well, you know, I always thought Bruce had tremendous vision. Uh, and I, sure, he'd say, yeah, that's about right. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is probably as good a moment as any to say we're delighted to have Amanda McLaren with us. Let's have a hand for Amanda. <laughs> McLaren must now be up there with Ferrari as one of the all-time great motorsporting names. And now that they're producing successful road cars as well, I mean, you, you have Ferrari, you do have McLaren, don't you? And isn't it interesting that Ferrari was the vision of one man, Enzo Ferrari? And, I mean, do you see in the road cars that they make, I know Bruce tried to make, or did make a prototype road car out of a Can-Am car, I think that Bruce would have loved the road cars that McLaren turned out now. Well, absolutely. I mean, he was going down that road. He, he had built the car, and Bruce used it as his daily driver just to iron out all the bugs. Uh, when they moved from number five David Road in Cornbrook to 17, they kept number five because that's where the road car production was going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was already heading off down that road and as you say about them being a team you know they are still the second most successful Formula One team after Ferrari and Ferrari had 16 years head start. And, and as we've seen in this last week now that they've finally decided to ditch Honda maybe they'll uh, start winning races again with the Renault engine we shall see. Right let's move on. Now this is a photograph that I really love because this shows you McLaren when they were getting into their first single seaters. Talk us through that lovely picture. Well, let's put the whole thing into context. So we, we saw the M1, we built that car at the end of 64, and then it was productionized. And in 65, we started to build the prototype Formula One car because the formula was changing starting in 66. Bruce was obviously planning to leave Cooper uh, and so here we are, early 66, and these are the first two production, you might say, uh, Formula One cars, the M2Bs. They use the Indy engine, sleeve back, or destroke back from uh, 4.2 litre to 3 litre. Made a fantastic noise, didn't actually go very fast. But anyway, <laughs> here we are. Chassis was brilliant. It was made in Malloy, early uh, sandwich construction. And in the picture, we've got, if we go from the left here, we've got Ian Young, that's me, and needs a haircut, and then we've got Bruce, then we've got other Bruce, this was Big Bruce and Little Bruce, they were called. Colin Beanland, the guy who came over with Bruce in the first year, he came here as a driver to Europe. Then we've got Chris Amon, who was going to be the driving the second car, and uh, Johnny Muller. So once again, all the Kiwis. I was going to say, there isn't a single person in that uh, picture who isn't a Kiwi. That's right. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's how work. Bruce must have believed that Kiwis could get the job done. Well, if you look at, uh, at that group, you know, um, nobody's married. Bruce was, but uh, the rest of them are all single guys. And so if you have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, well, that's just what you did. Well, there you are testing, I think, at Riverside. Yeah, this is actually the M2A, the prototype, which originally ran with an Oldsmobile in it, 
and it was called a tyre test car so that Charlie Cooper didn't get too much clue that Bruce was on his way leaving. And so this is the first time it ran with the Indy engine in, and this is at Riverside. And uh, there was a wing. Uh, we couldn't run a, the proper wing here because Dan Gurney was hanging around all the time. So we had a couple of days testing at, uh, at Riverside. Fortunately, we had to tow start it, didn't have a starter motor. Fortunately for me, I drove the tow car and the guy there taking the keys from Walt. Once it, now we've got three Kiwis, Walt, me, Bruce, and then Gary Knutson, an American. So the well, foreigners uh, were infiltrating. <laughs> One of the, something I love about that is, I mean, obviously the rear, the, uh, rear wing is work in progress, but somebody has written, um, this is an early example of advertising in Formula One. Somebody has written in uh, felt tip pen, <laughs> Ethan Jones. It would have to have been Tyler. <laughs> okay. um, now here you see a hard working mechanic uh, trying to show the boss that he knows what's wrong with the sparking plug. Yeah, so this is during the same test at Riverside. Yeah, Simon says I'm pretending I can read spark plugs. <laughs> okay. Now, this is when it's getting serious. This is the first ever appearance in a Grand Prix of a McLaren. This is Monaco. Tell us about that. Yeah, Monaco 66. So we'd gone from you know, 64 building the first car, May 66, here we are at McLaren's first Grand Prix. So it's come a long way since then. And uh, I knew that be on the right, leading the fuel injection system yet again, Tyler Alexander on top. And you don't see many Formula One drivers working on their car on the grid these days, but you know, <laughs> this was Bruce, he would, he'd would be right in there. And of course he designed the car in the first place. Well, he and, he and Robin Hurd. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes, because Robin Hurd had by then joined you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, moving on from that, um, we've been focusing on McLaren, up to now, but all this time, how you wanted to be a racing driver on your own account. And by various uh, moves and tucking and diving, all of which is in the book, you ended up with, this must have been your second Formula 3 yeah. car, yeah. which was a Chevron. And I particularly wanted this picture to be up here because this was really the day when most people who weren't right in the middle of what was going on, it was the day that most people thought, bloody hell, who is this man, Harden Gandhi? Because it was a Formula 3 race at Brands Hatch, or the long circuit of Brands Hatch, and you were delayed, I think. There were all the top F3 guys running, battling around at the front. You came through from the back to finish fourth? Fifth. Fifth. But you also lapped Brown's Hatch, the long circuit, the first ever 100 mile an hour lap in, in history. Now, yeah. that astonished a lot of people. Did it surprise you, or did you know you were that good anyway? You know, when you're on your way up, you always think you're good, and probably you shouldn't. But there's always that little uh, niggle in the back of your mind, maybe I'm just not quite quick enough. And I think after that, I had a bit better, more positive attitude to myself, but because it made such a difference to my life and my career uh, that Bruce followed my progress all the time and he used to say to me, uh, keep me informed, tell me what you're doing, and I used to get the Autosport reports from Simon was running it, I would highlight my name and then <laughs> I would either drop them off at the factory or I'd find out what hotel he was staying at the next Can-Am race and I'd bail them off. So, um, yeah, this event here, I was on pole for the heat, but I jumped the start. I was actually sliding across the line with no revs on, brakes locked up when he dropped the flag. So anyway, so I wanted on the road, but not by enough. So I had to start down the back of the grid, and he just made it on the back of the grid. And I thought, you know, nobody's going to take this away from me. And I just kept getting quicker and quicker and quicker. They're fabulous little car, absolutely brilliant car. And so I got into fourth place 
uh, as we came down to the last corner and I fell off of the grass and Francois had gone by. But the important silence is the 100 mile an hour lap, which had been the Formula One lap record not so many years before. And uh, I wasn't sure what would happen after that. And about two weeks after that event, the phone rings. It's Bruce. And he said, I'd like you to come to Goodwood for a Formula One test. So that just transformed my life, really. Went and did the test. And afterwards, Bruce said, right, I want you to be my protege, because I'm going to stop racing at the end of the year, and I'm going to put you into the Works 5000 car for a year to kind of tune you up. So that was the turning point. But then, what happened in May? Well, regrettably, Bruce had his accident. We carried on and, did, and finished the season, but my Formula One driver, McLaren, had evaporated. But what did happen, of course, was that you did end up in a McLaren in that wonderful formula. Well, I certainly enjoyed it. I was covering all these races as a young journalist. This was Formula 5000, where you had cars that were effectively as fast, certainly in the straight line, as Formula One cars, but were cheaper to make, much simpler, heavier production-based pushrod engine. And I think it's right to say, because they were fairly crude and brutal, it was a car that you could demonstrate car control and talent at the wheel. Yeah, well, it had plenty of horsepower, plenty of torque. The McLaren, the 10A was the 69 car, and this was the 70 car, the 10B, that Bruce had refined it. Bruce really loved it. He was involved in it. And so my car and the other words car, guess it's ours, were built at Combra in the Formula well, One shop. The others were all built at Trojan in Croydon. But Bruce was there working on this car when we were building it. And it was actually, for a 5,000 car, it was pretty sophisticated at the time. It had a great stiff monocoque. And as you say, you could slide it around. And there was a wonderful battle for the Formula 5000 Championship that year between two McLarens, yours and Pete Geffen's. And in the end, Pete Geffen just got the title, you were second. Well, Peter had done the year before, and I must say he put his, he, you know, he, he was quicker than me. I got with him a few times, but uh, in the end, he won it. And so my concentration was to make sure I didn't finish any worse than second. And that's what happened. So the two works cars were first and second. Our cars were probably had some little tweaks. We had a lot of little tweaks, which annoyed the, the customers. But anyway. <laughs> and <laughs> your performance car. was enough to get you straight into Formula One for BRM. Here you are. At, uh, yeah. Barcelona, well, right unfortunately, we uh, we went to Alton Park for the Gold Cup, and they had some Formula One cars there. And I was determined to cling on to the Formula One cars as long as I could, probably uh, a bit right off the air. And so that didn't do me any harm either. And then, uh, yeah, then there was a drive at uh, BRM because George Eaton had gone away. And uh, so I finished up. Actually, I started as the number four driver, but somehow I managed to wrestle my way into being the number three driver. So there I was. A word about BRM because uh, at the time it seemed from the outside looking in to be a complete political cauldron with Big Lou, the large Louis Stanley who lived in a suite at the top of the Dorchester Hotel in Park Lane, like a spider in the middle of a web trying to keep every, all the balls in the air. What was it like for you? I mean, the, you had in the team, who did you have? Joe Siffert, you had Pedro Rodriguez. Um, that, that was it in the end. It settled down at Pedro, Joe, and me. And then, sadly, Pedro was killed mid-season. So then there was Joe and I of the original, and then Peter Gethin came and joined. Um, well, Big Lou thought he was Enzo Ferrari, uh, which was a bit of a problem. And he used to, you know, Enzo used to have his minions call him from the race and tell him what had happened. And Big Lou played a bit of that game as well. Uh, he didn't really know that much about it, but he, yeah, as you know, his wife owned the team, or the family owned the team. and his, So his wife was controlling it because the two brothers didn't go to the races. And so uh, Big Lou was it. And um, 
Uh, yeah, he was a strange character, a double-edged sword. Uh, sometimes he could be absolutely marvelous, and other times he was just horrible. Um, but I guess he tolerated me. So. Well, you established yourself in that team. Now, I, I, I also, because I love hearing about the characters that we had in motor racing in the 1970s, Pedro Rodriguez, always somebody that I, from afar, thought was a real dramatic, romantic racing driver. You were his teammate. What was he like? Well, I was uh, a bit overawed by him, and he had that reputation, and he was supposed to be a bit fierce, and I didn't find him that way. Uh, and and Joe Sifford had a reputation for being a bit fiery. I didn't find him that way either. But what I was amused about is that there was terrible rival, not terrible, but a great rivalry between them from when they were driving the 917s for, for golf. And each one of them would come to me separately in some of the earlier races. I remember that Paul Ricard, the French Grand Prix. And Pedro was desperate for me to be quicker than Joe. And Joe was desperate for me to be quicker than Pedro. I didn't actually work out. But that's what they want. They wanted the new kid to be putting down the other one. It was, it was fantastic, the, the rivalry. And uh, you know what a sad thing when Pedro was killed. And then um, in 71, I think, there was that extraordinary race at Watkins Glen where there were five BRMs in the race, and I think they all finished. Yes, therein lay part of the problem, I said that in the book, that I think that was the start of BRM's downfall because there was a 30 car field, field's much bigger than today, and BRM had five of the 30, uh, and at the end of the race, there were only half the field was running, so 15 cars are running, but all five BRMs were running, and two of them in the points, Joe was second and I was fourth. So Big Lou knew then that he just had Formula One in the palm of his hand, which led to the fiasco the following year, when he uh, decided to run two teams, an A team and a B team, with five cars. And uh, that didn't work, because it didn't have enough engines first time. So, 1972, you were still with BRM. Yes. Um, and I think well, we, we ought actually to be, I'm forget, forgetting about all these lovely pictures, but we can think. Well, that's, that's yeah. Barcelona. That, that is a classic picture. That's yeah. Barcelona? Yeah, the Montjuï circuit, which is probably, from my point of view, the greatest circuit of all in Europe, maybe everywhere. And if you ever get a chance, you can still walk around it. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Better than Monaco. What it lacks is it doesn't have a palace and a harbour full of expensive boats, but <laughs> other than that, as a circuit, it was fantastic. And this was up past the pit straight, and you can see how far the car gets into the air, doing about 175 or so there. Um, and this is where uh, Graham and Jochen had their accidents. In the low, when because they went, up in the air. Uh, went over the, the hill and landed, and yeah. then the winch collapsed. So 175 miles an hour, you've got the barrier, you've got buildings, you've got <coughs> extremely hilly, bumpy road. Mm. Um, Formula One wouldn't take place in a place like that now. No, it probably wouldn't today, but it seems safe enough there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, the BRM taking the shortest route. Is that Ricard? That's at Paul Ricard, where the French Grand Prix is going back next year. And this is Silverstone British Grand Prix. It was a, a lovely little car. You could drive it on, as you can see here, on quite a lot of oversteer. And it was just so controllable. Really a nice car. And then now, moved we've to got to talk about this. This is the Italian Grand Prix in 71. This is later. So this is the later car. I, I had the 153 up to mid-season and then Finally, they had built enough of the 160. 160 was a harder car to drive. It was more knife edge, but it was faster. So this is the start of uh, 71 Italian Grand Prix. And the front row is Jackie X, number three, and Chris Amon, number 12. Joe Siffert and I are the second row. Jack, uh, Francois Severs on the third row. And uh, when I thought the bloke, had, the mayor of Monza, wherever he was, was hot. He was getting a shaky hand holding the flag, so I just dropped the clutch. 
And as I went, started to go through, or past the front row, I thought, whoops, overdone that, I could get penalised. And at that moment, Clay Regazzoni and number four, from the fourth row, came close. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know, Clay Regazzoni at Monza in a Ferrari, there's no penalties. <laughs> And of course it was the most incredible slipstreaming race, uh, which was won by Peter Gantin at the BRM. Yes. But it could quite easily have been you that won it. Well, yeah, we were swapping places all the way around the lap. Because in those days, the, you only lifted off twice. So you would pass the pits all the way around Curva Grand and down to Lesmo 1. You had to change down for that. You could then do Lesmo 2 flat. Ascari was flat all the way back to Parabolica and he had to slow down and change down. So it was just a massive slipstream thing. So we got down to five of us for a while and then Chris Amon um, pulled his visor off. So in the mantra. In the mantra. So he dropped back and then there were four of us. And then Peter Gethin managed to tow up on us and grab the win. Yeah, wonderful yeah. stuff. Okay, so that's Monza. Um, <laughs> now, here's a BRM, but a different type of BRM. Yeah, well, of course, uh, I guess they figured they didn't actually have enough to do, so they built some Can-Am cars. <laughs> and uh, at the end, Brian Redman was supposed to drive it in America the last two races. He went to Laguna Seca, and then sadly Joe Siffert was killed at Brian's hatch. And so Brian, having been his co-driver, wanted to go to the funeral as I was going. And then I get to call in the, at about two o'clock in the morning. Any time the phone used to ring then, it was either my mother calling from New Zealand, or it was Big Lou calling me from Trompington. So on this occasion, he said, Ganley, would you like to go to Riverside to drive the can car? And I thought, uh, what would Joe do? Yeah, Joe would go with me. So I went. And uh, fortunately, I finished third overall behind the two orange McLaren. So I won the non-works McLaren class, <laughs> which was another great result for me. I was so happy. Was it a nice car to drive? It was a brilliant car. I had uh, I'd done some testing for McLaren and I'd done testing for March in their can -Am cars and then drove this. <coughs> this was for sure the best of the three. And in fact, in practice here at Riverside, Denny Holm followed me up through the S's of series of really fast corners and afterwards I noticed I got away from him. Afterwards he came and said that thing of yours is fantastic, I couldn't keep up with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now moving away from Formula One for a moment, of course in those days a racing driver didn't just think he was a Formula One driver. If there was a Can-Am race he'd do that, if there was a sports car race he'd do that and of course Formula One drivers wanted to win the Le Mans 24 Hours. Yeah. And that was the wonderful French team, Matra, with those V12 engines. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, that was another lucky break for me. Um, it was actually at the Canadian Grand Prix, and uh, Ronnie Peterson and Tim Schenken came to a big secret. We've just signed for Ferrari to do sports cars. I thought, you lucky guys, God, I wish I could have a sports car drive. About half an hour later, Jeremy Cronbach, the French journalist who used to sort out mattress driving, came on. Would you like to drive for us at Le Mans? Would I want? <laughs> so <laughs> there, there we were. But it, the thing was done so thoroughly, much better than they did in those days. I know today people do it. We did three 24-hour tests at Ricard uh, with all the drivers in one car, just thrashing the thing to death. And uh, then the race, I, I shared the car with Francois Sever, and we led, mostly led for about 20 hours, and then I was, got caught out in the rain on the wrong tyres, and I was trying to get it back, <coughs> aquaplaning, and uh, a lady came charging through the spray in the Chevy Corvette, presumably on rain tyres, and crashed straight in the back of me, whacked the whole... Mary Yes. She still thinks I'm her best friend. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. she, I heard her telling someone that I've forgiven her for that. No, <laughs> so by the time I 
Dri I was able to drive it back very slowly. Fortune didn't break the drive shaft, broke the suspension, but not the drive shaft. So I got back to the pits, but we lost 10 laps, so we lost our lead, and then, so we finished second. So you lost 10 laps, that means they must have mended the car, what, in about 35 minutes, 40 minutes? Less than that, because it took a long time to drive it back. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. But you were second. Well, so, yeah, we finished second, you know. What's the word about, about uh, Francois Senna? Because, I mean, I think in Matra in those days, they wanted to have a French, one French driver in each car. Um, so you were with Francois Senna, um, and I think you got to know him pretty well after that. I did, yeah. The policy was uh, they only wanted Formula One drivers, and as you say, there was one French Formula One driver in each, so that was what Beltoise, Pescarolo, and Francois, and then two Kiwis, although they thought I was English with the heart, <laughs> uh, and Graham Hill. And uh, Francois was just the most fantastic guy, I mean, you know, so talented, and uh, you've probably heard all the stories about him. And he was a really worthy successor to Jackie at Tyrrell, and uh, for sure he would have been world champion. Um, and then, uh, you know, the thing at Watkins Glen. So, Terrible. Um, at the end of the year, we were all going to. I said, right, we're re you're all resigned for next year. And then the French government apparently asked to put in some more money because, you know, being a, a missile company, it's all French government money. And uh, so they said, you know, all the roast beefs and the kiwis, gone. And so uh, it was French drivers only then. I don't know if we've got them coming up. Yes, very neatly. So you were out of Matra, but you still wanted to race sports cars? Well, what happened, uh, you know, was a sort of a last minute thing. They suddenly said, uh, no, no, you, know, you haven't got a deal for next year. Oh, dear. And it, fortunately for me, they, they called uh, Golf and, and gave me a recommendation. So I get a call from Golf, please come to Goodwood, do some tyre testing and Next thing I'm signed up as a driver for them. Now that meant that you were driving for the man who they called Death Ray, the man yes. who'd been uh, the Aston Martin team manager in their great days, then run the GT40s and was still running long distance sports cars, John Wyatt. Was he as terrifying as everybody says? No, he wasn't actually. Uh, I thought underneath he was quite shy. Uh, he had that death ray persona and sure he could give you the you know the, the full laser stare uh, but I didn't find him anything like his reputation I thought he was a really nice guy he had stood back a little bit John Horseman was running the team and I think we've come to a picture of John shortly uh, but John was always behind and he was every race he was a great tactician and he he would be working out Area the detail, this needs to be all that time. You can see why he won them on with uh, Aston. One of your great drives for Mirage was at Spa. What was it like <laughs> driving a car around the old Spa? Well, Spa, old Spa was one of my favourite tracks. Right? Um, no, old old Nurburgring, the 14 mile one, old Spa in Monaco and Monterey. Um, yeah, that was another one of my classic um, ways of snatching second place from the win. I, I normally shared with Derek Bell and uh, unfortunately Mike Haywood in the second car had sat on the fuel filler uh, before the start and the start in those days was downhill. We sat on the fuel filler and all the fuel <coughs> came in and burned his bum basically. So he did about four laps, came in the pits, jumped out of the car and uh, Vern Schuchen got in and then John said to me, can you get in the other car? Can you get back in that car? So I got in the second car and the idea was that when I'd done that stint, I would then get out of that. I'd get back in my car with Derek. Anyway, because of the overlaps. Um, so we'd gone right, second car had gone right to the back of the field. We dragged it up to second place, but um, John left Mike in my space and I took his space and we finished second and Mike and Derek won. <laughs> There's something in your book about 
what it's like going through the Master King. Um, I mean, explain, I think most people know about the Master King, but for those in the audience who don't, describe on the old spa circuit that king and what it was like and how quick he was. Well, yeah, it was one of those things that people talk about, you know, the Master King, the Master King. It was, it was a, had this great mythology about it. And the theory was that if you could do it flat, you were getting along pretty well. But supposedly you couldn't, or you could. And Dan Gurney was reputed to be the man who, only man who ever did it flat in the early days. Well, Chris Amon said he did it flat on the second to last lap of the 1970 Grand Prix when he was in the dice with Pedro. He said he never would want to do it again. Anyway. Um, <laughs> We got there with the mirages, and you, you know, you go down the straight long, you've come down the hill from Burnenville, so you've got a fair bit of momentum, and you're doing just over 200 by the time you get down that part of the straight. And of course, of course you do have to do the Master King flat. And, okay, so I drove around there in the hire car, and I looked at that and I thought, you couldn't do that flat in a million years, there's no way, because it went between some houses, it was, it was quite a you know, left and a right corner, 200 mile an hour. And, and there were houses on both sides? How, yeah, so it's a blind entry, you couldn't see going in because of the houses. And um, anyway, so I get out there and practice and you know, I have a big lift and then I little lift and I thought, you know, they're paying me a lot of money, I suppose I'd better do it flat. So I tried it flat and it worked. So then once you've done it once, you know, you can keep doing it. But I saw it described as a metric of testicular fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> interestingly, I came down there part way through the race and I said, the entry is blind, you don't know what's there. And I'm in here at, at, at over 200 and there's a little two litre car wandering about right in the middle of the road. And I thought, this is going to be, a, you know, my heart rate must have gone like that. I thought, this is going to be a hell of a shot, isn't it? Anyway, with about a fag packet either side, I got between him and the guardrail. And when I looked in the mirror, he was, he died for the other side. I think his heart must have looked better than yours. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the mirage. Um, uh, this is at uh, this is at Lamont. That that's a mirage scene. Talk us through. So, uh, the guy that needs the haircut's me, obviously, and this is my late wife, Judy, with the red hair, who did all the timekeeping, and Lynn Bailey, the guy in the pink shirt, the guy who designed the mirage, and was one of the leading designers on the GT40, and this is John Horseman, who'd been John Wire's right hand man through GT40s and 917 Porsches and then the Mirages. Great. I, I, I love that picture because it really shows you the atmosphere of Le Mans. Everybody craning, craning down, looking to see who's coming through White House first. Now, back to Formula One. And you left BRM under what sort of circumstances? Well, um, yeah, I thought BRM, was, well, it was a bit of a shambles, running two cars and then Big Blue. Uh, you know, Enzo Ferrari used to rest his drivers from time to time. Then, you know, they would turn up at the race and there's no car for you. Well, so Big Lou decided to play that game. He did that to me once. And I thought, I don't really like this. But anyway, he offered me a very attractive deal for 73. But it wasn't quite enough money. And I guess I was getting a bit greedy. And I said to him, okay, you've got all those old race cars in store up the, uh, the road there in Bourne. I said, can I have that one and that one? Yes, okay, we agree with that. So, okay. You had to go to the Dorchester and you sat in front of those revolving doors um, with him and he would tell you about everyone who came in. So he'd say, you see that woman there? She's having an affair with somebody else. And, uh, somebody else is, uh, oh, that one, yeah, he's sleeping with so and How does he know all this rubbish? Anyway, so you negotiate the contract. And then he would, uh, he'd get up and he'd go off, disappear for a bit, and then he'd come back and he'd say, I've just called the test house and they found another 25 horsepower. Well, <laughs> if when all the BRM drivers compared the stories, we must have had 700 horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, he just went for a pee and he came back with the next story. <laughs> anyway, 
So I uh, came back to sign the, the contract, the final one, and uh, I'm looking at the, I said, but you haven't put these two cars in there. No, I don't want to do that, but you can trust me. And I thought, if I know there's someone I can't trust, it's you. <laughs> so there was an offer from Frank Williams and Marlborough wanted to change teams, and they said to me, if you go to Williams with our money, um, you know, that would suit us very well. So that's what I did. So here you are so here I am with Williams. Williams. Is that Monaco? That's Monaco coming out of Casino Square. And what happens, you see that on television with the big dip, and the car slides down. Very shortly, the, the uh, left rear wheel will be kissing the arm track. As you can see, I'm trying quite hard there. Nice little bit of opposite arm, yeah. And I love the spectators, that's the tip top bar, just a bit further down, and they're all just kind of leaning on the uh, arm. Yeah, you probably couldn't do that today. I don't think <laughs> Now that also is an interesting uh, picture because you are leading Jackie Stewart and Emerson Fittipaldi, world champions both. Uh, that's the Canadian Grand Prix and nobody quite seems to be quite sure where you finished in that race. Yeah, what happened was that uh, it, shortly before the race was a torrential downpour and uh, I had remembered that it had happened some years before when Bruce McLaren was driving the M5 and Bruce was about to win the race because it dried out. And that was the key to it. And I thought, maybe history will repeat itself. So I didn't mess my car. Everyone else put more wing in and disconnect the rear end your old bars or put soft springs on it. I thought, I'm going to leave it with the dry settings on. Anyway, so off we go. The pits in those days at Mossport were about <coughs> wide. It was, it was ridiculous. You couldn't get the whole field in there. So I thought, I'll wait till everyone's made their stop. So I stayed out late at last. Because I also wanted them, the team to have a practice on Tim Schenker, who was in the other car. <laughs> because people didn't practice pit stops in those days, changing time. So I waited till then. Obviously, I was in the lead. Dive it made a terrific stop because I had a empty pit lane took and I'm gone. And uh, then I came up behind the, uh, there was an accident between Schechter and Francois Severe. So the pace car is out. First time they used a pace car in a Grand Prix. And when I come up to overtake it to go on, they said, oh, no, you're leaving. Oh, all right then. So we troll around behind the pace car. And uh, then finally we released and I thought, well, they obviously they think I'm a race winner, I'd better take off, so right, off I went. Um, so, I, yeah, I steamed around there for quite a few laps, but eventually Jackie crept up, um, and then uh, I chopped him off a few times, I didn't let him pass, but anyway, eventually he got past, and then Emerson came up, and his car was so much quicker on the straight, he just blew past me, and then he blew past Jackie. I think Emerson won the race, and I think I was third. But in fact, the official results said... Well, it said that I'm sixth, and Jackie Stewart was third. <coughs> but as he'd been into the pits twice, and it fell out of Jack once, I don't think that would ever be true. <laughs> but I think what they did, they knew where everyone started, and at the end of the race, they thought, well, who do we know? Well, who do we know? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they wrote down some names. Obviously, they couldn't ignore me because I had been leading, for sure. And then they made all the lines join up, and they said, that's the result. Of course, they didn't have sophisticated electronic timing gear in those days. But what they did have was lap charters. Yes. And Judy, your wife, was a terrific lap charter. She was fantastic. She would be able to plot every car on every lap without getting flustered. Yes, that's right. So who did she think? Well, where, where did she think you finished? Well, she conceded afterwards. Incidentally, they asked for, for a number of teams lap start, and they didn't want Judy for some reason anyway. <laughs> and I thought she was probably as good as any of them. So she did concede she might have had a little blip. And it, it, she reckons I was first or third. For some reason, I couldn't be seen. I can't remember why. And so the alternative was Emerson won. Yeah. So I'm happy. I'd be happy to be third. Yeah, right. Now, 
you, um, your relations with Frank Williams, uh, and I know you're now very good friends with him, but you had a very difficult time with Frank Williams because the cars were very unreliable. You had all sorts of agonizing retirements. But you then decided to make your own Formula One car. There it is. And I think that was the reason, quite wrongly, why Frank Williams decided that you weren't on his side. Yeah. Um, interestingly, when he put me into the 5000 car, Bruce Clarence said to me, you know, one day you'll want to build your own car. And I said, never, not in a million years would I ever want to do that. But anyway, I became very frustrated at Williams because so many silly little breakages and stuff going on and, and the thing overheated constantly because they wouldn't uh, put some proper radiator ducts on. Just easy things to fix, they wouldn't do it. So I got really frustrated. So in secret, myself and a guy called <coughs> Martin Reed, AKA Cream Butt, we drew and built Formula One car, and it was it was progressed with all the other bits uh, over there somewhere. Anyway, um, and I said to Marlboro, uh, they said, "What what what can we do? Because this is not working." And I said, "All right." The main man came over to me. And I took him to my workshop, which I had in Windsor, and I said, "Look, there it is. There's a there's a Formula One car which I think addresses all the faults in the weather." And uh, what I'll do is, you'll do, if you just pay me the bare cost, what I've got in it, it's yours. You give it to Frank. And, but, I, but I need to come with it. Anyway, so they said to Frank, right, here's the answer. He thought I was trying to take his team off. I wasn't. I was actually handing the car over. So we kind of fell out over that. But anyway. But that was, sort of that. Um, I mean, since that wonderful wooden soapbox and then the little car you built at 14, that was the next Ganley, wasn't it? You, yes. you, you'd have, had a long time where you thought of yourself just as a driver. That was really <coughs> sowing the seed of Harden Ganley in race car manufacture. Yeah, because when you're driving, you always want the best piece of equipment. And when you see things with cars that you know are wrong, <coughs> then you know, it starts to really eat at you. So, uh, we're talking about ca cars that have things wrong with them. Just before we go on to the cars that you built, an extraordinary uh, time in your career, a rather short time, a car that very nearly killed you, mm. which is the Japanese Mack. <coughs> a lot of people haven't heard about you, you. Some of you may think you've never heard of a Formula One car and a Formula One team called Mackey. Uh, the only man who ever drove for them oh, is... Tony Trimmer later. Oh, Tony Trimmer did, yes. <laughs> he did one race for them, I think. No, he never started a race. Oh, he never started a race, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about your short and not particularly sweet time with Mackey. Well, uh, <coughs> having sort of fallen out with Frank, you know, I had a contract with him for the following year, but we agreed that we would disagree. And so... Uh, I went to drive for March, but they were having trouble with the money and their big sponsor <coughs> didn't arrive. You know, there's always a big sponsor that doesn't arrive in racing. And uh, so I drove for them in South America. Uh, while I was there, I got a phone call from a guy with a sing songy Japanese, not English thing. And I thought it was Peter Githen or Tim Schenken pulling my leg. <laughs> and so I played along and then was an <laughs> then I get to Brazil and I get another phone call and I think, well, only Schenken and Gethin know where I am, do they? So, ah, oh, Mr. Cannon, are you trying to drive our car? So I played along again anyway, then I got some more phone calls. Finally came back to England and uh, they contact me again and, all right, I'll come and meet you. And uh, so I said, well, where do you want to meet? Ah, uh, Hercolo. And I said, pardon? Ah, uh, Hercolo. Anyway, I finally figured out that's Earl's Court Road. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then we're at we're at Earl's Court Road. Ah, Pizzeran, Pizzeran, Pizza Land. Okay, Pizza Land. So I meet these guys, and they show me all their plans. And I'm thinking, well, you know, March, uh, 
right on the bubble here with the money. And uh, so I thought maybe there's some possibility. So they, you know, they had four cars and 55 engines and all the rest of it. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. And who's the other driver? Oh, no, Mr. Canary, all for you. <laughs> well, dream come true, isn't it? Too good to be true, and it was. But anyway, <laughs> so I signed up with them, and they came with a car that didn't meet the regulations, which was a bit of a problem. <laughs> uh, eventually, after about, uh, I suppose, nearly mid-year, we had a huge shouting match. And I said, if you don't modify this car, you know, it's or else. I don't know what or else was, but anyway. So they worked night and day and did everything I wanted, and there it is. Yeah. But it never raced. Well, it didn't help themselves because finally it's ready for the British Grand Prix. So I'm down there at Branch Hatch, first practice, they don't turn up. And we come. So I phone back to the workshop. Is it? Uh, English guy there, and I said, well, have they left yet? Oh yeah, they loaded up last night, but he said they're just sitting around the workshop drinking tea. Well, are they coming? Are they coming soon? Oh, yeah. So they never showed up. And um, anyway, so the following day they did come, but by then you've lost a whole day. So we had the wrong ratios, and in the end didn't qualify, which was a shame. And you then went to the German Grand Prix two weeks later. Yes, well, I gave them a big lecture that, you know, you've just shot yourselves in the foot. I think there was a loss of face worry then. So by coming, only coming the second day, they knew they had the excuse for not qualifying. Um, and uh, so, yeah, then the following race, Nürburgring, the car was ready to go right at the start of first practice, and I thought, finally, these guys are learning. But. Well, tell us what happened. All right, well, I'll show you what happened. Here's the picture. Well, I tell you before that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, um, so I'm steaming along there, and I thought, this is this all right. Is nerve this is a nervous ring. And suddenly, at pretty high speed, the car just turns right, woof, into the barrier. The rear suspension had broken. And uh, so it chopped the, you can see where my knees go, uh, it chopped the whole front of the car off, and unfortunately, chopped my feet and legs. Well, you, you're, you're, you're I mean, you're going over it very quickly, but I mean, let's just focus on this. Uh, the front of the car had been torn off. Your legs, feet and legs, were actually out the front. I mean, yes. if that picture had yeah. been taken while you were still in the car, we would have seen you from kind of knees down. Yeah. 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 And without going into the grisly detail, I mean, that was an accident that stopped you for, I mean, how long was it before you got back into a racing car? Uh, back at Nürburgring, the uh, following April. Right. So it was, the rehab was that long. Right. Yeah. But, and that you know, was I'm the not, end of the Mackie. They went well, back to Japan. No, they, they, they then built it, because they had four cars, so they put another car together and Tony Trimmer uh, attempted to qualify it for the next couple of years. And then, but never did. Never did. Okay, right, now let's jump ahead to... So this, is a, this is April, my, my that first was your race return. This is my return. Yeah. Tell us about what's going on there. Well, um, Tim Schenken, who's behind me there, uh, he was driving for Jello and they bought two of the Mirages, the factory cars that I'd been driving earlier on. So I was asked if, if I was fit enough to drive, well, of course I said yes, and um, would I share with Tim in the 1,000 Ks? And we were leading with four laps to go, and the team owner, George, decided that we needed to make an extra fuel stop because Willie, Willie Carlson, who was running the works alphas, told him they were going to stop. They weren't at all, that was going to be So Willie is still laughing about the fact that he fuel stop. So here we were in the lead, going along very nicely, and we make another stop, and we lose the race by 20 seconds. And we've got here, from the left, you, Tim Schenken, Jacques Lafitte, Arturo Mazzario with his classic cowboy hat, uh, little um, Herbie, Muller, Herbie Muller, who yeah. died... He was remember. killed uh, he was a long killed. time ago. Yeah. And then... Um, Leo Kunin, who died not so long ago. Yeah. Right. 
This was one of the stranger cars. You didn't race it, but you did test it. The six-wheeled barge. Um, the rumor always was, this was started by horrible journalists, that uh, this was all a fiddle by Max Mosley, who wanted to get a bit of attention, and it was a perfectly conventional car with two wheels driven at the back, but he put on two extra wheels to make it look a bit smart. But Hardman has tested this car, and you say that's nonsense. Yeah, they had a bit of teething trouble. The first time I drove the car, the transmission seized on the way out of the pits. Unfortunately, it didn't hit anything. Uh, and then they came back and we ran it for a while and it gave some trouble. Um, and then I didn't drive it again for some time until finally they said, can I come to Saltstone? It was pour, pouring with rain, absolutely torrential rain. And this thing just had the most amazing traction. So. Yeah, the story that there were only two wheels driving and Max Robert told me to go easy on the accelerator is totally untrue, nothing in that. And I've always said that if it had only had two of those little wheels driving, it would have just sat there and spun them. As it was, it just bit and went, and it was, and it was terrific through all the puddles and everything. And that was the way to go, uh, really, and you know, Williams built one later on. I've talked to Patrick Head about that, and they both had the same problem, that the, there were things were too heavy, having another whole set of axles and things meant you would have had to have a major expensive program to get it down to weight. And I think the FIA saw wisely, the FIA is not very wise usually, but in this case, they saw there was going to be an, an arms race, and they said, right, four wheels only. Right. But that would have turned out to be the quicker the car. Although the car, um, was then sold by March to a hill climber, Roy Lane. Just the back end. Oh, he just sold the back end? Yes. Okay, but I mean, he had a lot of success in hill climbing. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah. So he'd obviously had, had, all that tra had all that traction, yeah. 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 And if it had only ever had two wheels driving, Roy wouldn't have got anywhere with it either. So that story is, is sure. total fantasy. Sure. As I said in the book, I asked, who makes up these stories? <laughs> 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 now, when I'm going to make uh, an important leap in your career, because having said that you never wanted to build racing cars, you then began to design and build racing cars. You went into business yes. with Tim Schenken, yes. because you said he was well organized and you were quite good at deciding what cars would be like. So you were a kind of complementary pair. Yeah, Tim's a great administrator, and still is, because he runs uh, the whole uh, Australian racing. Um, and he brought a project to me one day. Someone wanted him to fund a Formula Ford car. And he brought it around to see me and I read it. And I said, this looks pretty good. Forget the mate, why don't we do it? And you know, we could see the end of our racing careers. When you've driven in Formula One or at that level, you are unemployable. <coughs> so you can only work for yourself. You can have a job with anyone. Else. And so we set off to build these Formula Ford cars. Uh, Tim wanted to call them Ganleys, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So we came up with one of our names. We wanted an animal name, and you know, lions and tigers and all that stuff, they're all pretty much fake. You couldn't have tiger, G-E-R, because Leyland owned that on the trucks. But there's jaguars and leopards and all that stuff. So anyway, um, we can pronounce it tiger, animal, sort of, and T-I from Tim, G-A from Ganley. What we should have done was taken the T-Y from Timothy and then we wouldn't have got the Tiger thing that we get all the time. Anyway, well, so we set people, off to do that. They pronounce it right, they call it Tiger. They call it Tiger, yeah, yeah. I've had people tell me that. I had a guy in America said to me, I was correcting him, he said, listen, I know the guy that owns that company and he told me it's Tiger. And I said, well, I own it, I'm telling me it's Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Then I had an Australian guy not so long ago who kept calling it Tiger, and I, and I corrected him again and again. And finally I said, why, why do you keep saying Tiger when I'm coming into Tiger? He said, because that's what it is, mate, it's a Tiger. <laughs> I thought, you ignorant Oz. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> it's very good to hear the Kiwi doing your Australian. <laughs> so. Instead of going straight to a single seater, we've actually, I mean, you did make some very, a lot of very successful single seats. Yes. But you then moved into, this is Sports 2000. Sports 2000, yeah. And you were enormously successful with that. 
Yes, well, John Webb started, you know, uh, Branch Hatch Webb, uh, Wobby Webb, he started that to me. And he called me up one day and he said, I'm starting this new formula and it's going to be called Sports 2000. And I thought, that'll be just like F100, it looks a failure, I'm not going to do it. Anyway, so Tim was on my case, come on, you've got to do this. And I said, no, no, it'll be a failure. There's no one else doing that. Anyway, eventually we got an order and we designed some cars and refined them. And then uh, we dominated the thing for years. It's, it was absolutely magic. So do you know how many Sports 2000 cars you built? 250, roughly. Where are they all now? Oh, they're scattered about all over the world. They keep turning up. People bring them. There was about five of them at Silverstone earlier in the year. One, yeah. One so, yeah, that, um, when we started the company, I said to Tim, 10 years is all I'm going to do, and then I'm out of here. Not one day more. And that's, regardless of what happened, you know, and that's, what, we didn't stick to that. But anyway, so uh, then Vern Schupen commissioned the Can-Am car. And uh, that was derived from our Formula 2 car. These were the days when a can -Am car could have a central seat. Uh, I, I think these cars look absolutely wonderful. In fact, well, one well, of my dreams would be to have one of those, uh, put a couple of headlights on the front, and go to Tesco's. In it. Yeah. <laughs> Make a wonderful road car. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And you made two of those. We made, this was the ADT car, and then we refined it quite a bit, and um, I'll talk about him in a bit. Um, then we did the, uh, the 82 car, which was a much better car, probably one of the best cars we ever built. And they're both alive and well. Now we get to um, endurance racing cars that you built. Yeah, well, I had people on me about, you know, can't you do a Group C car or an IMSA car? And uh, yeah, you know, that was pretty tempting. And we got a commission to build the last Mirage for Harley Clarkston, uh, the M12, and we did that. And I had a policy there. I would, uh, I would sort of do the concept. I wanted to be that long, that wide, and that engine, and that gearbox, and all the rest of it. And um, then I would have a talented chap would come and actually do the drawing, and then I'd go to the drawing. And, no, 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 that. Anyway. And um, a chap came to me from university and he said, I'd like to be a race car designer, I want to learn about it, and I'll give you four years of my time if you'll take me on. And I did, and he turned out to be a genius, and here he is, Mike Coughlin, stand yeah. up. Stand up, Mike. So this really is my, this car, um, well, it's Forerunner, uh, it's another earlier one, we'll see. Um, started off with a Chevy engine, uh, but it wouldn't really do the fuel mileage in Group C. And so I went for a holiday in New Zealand. And while I was out of town, Mike redesigned it and sorted it out. And it, uh, so it had a DFL in it and ran in C2. And that particular car won Le Mans and the World Championship. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> where, where is that car now? Where is it? Um, oh, I think it's in Switzerland, yeah. Okay. okay. Right, well, more great tigers. This is, this is a, a wonderful model. Well, this is basically the same car uh, here, a late, not that actual car, but a, another one the same. And then we were asked if we could build a smaller lights car uh, for America. So it's the two categories, there's the big cars, the IMSA cars, and then there was the camel lights cars. So we did this sort of interim car, uh, a half size one, that took all kinds of engines, Buick, Chevy, uh, Mazda, um, Ferrari, and on and on like that. And it really was a, it was just a scaled down version of the bigger car. At the height of, of Tiger, how many people did you employ? I mean, it must have become quite a big operation. Well, we were running, uh, apart from building cars, just, you know, we, we never wanted to make things too easy for ourselves. And we were asked by Marlborough to run a young, a 
Italian guy called Andrea de Cesare, in Formula 3. And so we put that in a separate company and Tim basically ran that. It was called Team Tiger, Marlboro Team Tiger as it became. And we ran Andrea for some time. And um, so with that and all the production staff, and we used to make our own bodywork, um, molds and everything, and machine shop, fab shop, a lot. We had about 30, just over 30 people, which was I mean, that must quite, be quite enough of a hit. A, a big overhead. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, you can't make any money building production racing cars, can you? Yeah. Uh, In fact, I mean, I mentioned earlier about how you reckoned you built 400 cars, but enough bits to make another 400. Was it Max Mosley who said the best way to run a business would be to give the cars away for free? and then make all the profit out of the spare parts. <laughs> yes, because the great thing about uh, production race cars is that every Monday morning the phone rings and rings and rings <laughs> with people who've crashed their cars and they want spares. And, you know, they, there's huge profit margin in that. Yeah. You don't make much out of the car, so Max was right. Uh, we eventually adopted the March policy, you know, if it costs you £10 to make it, you make it £20, make it £40, 10%, £44, so you know, that's a good margin. Sounds <laughs> like a good business. Yeah. Well, you said you'd only do it for 10 years. Yes. Did you stick to your promise? I ran over by about six months okay. before I extricated myself. Yeah. Um, Was that difficult to do? I mean, you'd have this totally absorbing business, which had been very successful. Yeah, because I used to love getting up in the morning, going to work, building more cars. I like productionizing things. You know. <coughs> How can I make 20 uprights much cheaper and faster and better? Uh, things like that. So I did like all of that. But, you know, it's very wearing because you're there seven days a week. And, uh, you know, I was very lucky. My wife was very supportive. But I thought 10 years was enough and you know I like to break my life down and things I had plenty of other things to do I didn't need to be building racing cars all day so was it, was it profitable for you did you make lots of money running Tiger no we don't make any money um, I made a few I probably made a few more you know, but it's not uh, I think until you get up to say <coughs> building Indy cars or something like that it, there's not a lot of margin there because down the amateur end, you can't charge that much. People don't have that sort of money. So, you, and then of course, if they keep crashing the car, they get tired of it. They don't want to keep coming and buying their expensive spares. So, yeah, we made money every year, but not mega money. Well, we could talk on an awful lot, not only about Tiger, but also about what you've done since uh, your role with the BRDC during a particularly dramatic period. Um, in the BRDC's time, the fact that you're now a book publisher, um, the fact that you've gone back to being a journalist, because I think I'm right in saying you were actually a motor racing journalist when you were about 16, weren't you? Well, sort of. Um, I, because I was interested in racing and wasn't old enough to race, I used to write articles about racing for a couple of magazines. I had a regular column in what became Cars of Cars the Street. It was Sports Cars Douglas became Armstrong. Car. Douglas Armstrong was the editor. And uh, so I was his New Zealand correspondent that I wrote for local papers. And uh, in fact, when I came to England, I went around and met Douglas and thought, you know, I'm, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm your New Zealand correspondent. And he, I'm sure he didn't believe it was me. He must have worked out by then. I had to be a school kid to try sending this stuff in. Uh, I don't think he ever really got it. But um, then I was the dumbest kid in the world at school. I was pretty good at sports. And I hated schoolwork. I couldn't do anything except that I could write. And I got very high marks in English. I was so bad at mathematics, unless it was about money, that the math teacher told me to go to the art class. So I did that. And, <clears throat> it was obvious I was never going to pass an exam, much to my parents' disappointment. But I knew the first 10 positions or so in every world championship race from the beginning. <clears throat> my mother thought, what a huge waste of a very expensive education. <laughs> I didn't have a very good education. And uh, finally they said, 
okay, you're never going to pass the exams. And I said, no, of course, I'm going to be a Grand Prix driver. What do I need some exams for? Well, they said, all right, if you can find a proper professional job, whatever that meant, you can leave school. Ooh. So I went to the local newspaper editor and showed him all my clippings and he gave me a job. So I said, hey, Mum, you know, I'm well, out of here. Most people start on local newspapers. <laughs> now, um, we could continue to talk um, all night, and I would love to do so. Um, if you want to know all the other stories, ladies and gentlemen, the book is there. But we've just got about enough time. We've got a roving radio mic somewhere. If any of you, ladies and gentlemen, have got some questions for her, bits of his career which I haven't covered, maybe Mike would like to ask a question. I think you need someone to start. Mike, I think you could be the man. <laughs> one, one thing I remember about Howland was he always said um, one of the things he'd always look for in all these shops as he would go racing at Spa, Stavolo, I think he'd say, you'd oversteer the Mirage of Stavolo. And all you'd ever see was the um, photographs being taken as he'd oversteer down the hill. And he said he'd never, and I've looked for them, never been able to find a picture of a car, one of his cars driving down. So if anybody knows one of those, they're helping them. <laughs> they ask for them. <laughs> I don't know where we look for that. No, any, any, other any, any yes. Gareth, there we go. I have to say, Howard, those images, fabulous. Thank wonderful. you. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. wonderful. Uh, Howden, uh, recently looking for something else, I came across a photograph of you driving a Citroen SM on the tour of Britain, I think 1974. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about that adventure and any other unusual cars you drove? Well, that, apart from the Mackie, that was the most unusual. It was uh, Ray Hutton, who at that time was sports editor of Water Car before he became the editor. and. When it was announced, there was going to be this tour of Britain, you know, which was a copy of the tour of France. Uh, he said, oh, "Would you like to do that?" And and I was driving for uh, Gulf and sports cars at Williams and Formula One. I needed to take a weekend off, but so <laughs> being dumb, I said, "Oh yeah." <coughs> so then he's looking for a car. So he went to Citroen, and they said, "Well, you can have uh, this SM." And yeah, okay, that sounds good. So off we go. Part of the problem was that the rules said the car had to be absolutely standard, and what should have happened is it should have had the stiff valves put in. You know, forget what the rules said. Should have put the stiff valves in because the thing just rolled about and tore the tires up all the time. So yeah, we had about three days of no sleep, and I managed to crash into the barrier at. Uh, at Alton Park, and uh, I crashed into a few other competitors trying to push him off the road in Snetterton. And in the end, we had this battered old car that we came back to. Sit, I'm sure, they weren't very happy about it, but it was an experience. I'm not sure I want to do it again tomorrow. You, you, you don't see yourself as a rally driver. Well, not in a Citroen. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Another question. Somebody must have a last question for her. There's one. Yeah, there's one right over there. Which side of I'm not as quick as I used to be. Whereabouts here? You got um, you got to the point where you designed and built the monocoque of a Formula One car and then you gave it away to Frank or whatever. Um, and then when you went on to form a company with Tim to uh, design and build lots of other cars, do you ever wish or regret that you hadn't uh, formed your own Formula One team? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's a huge undertaking. It was a lot easier then because basically you could go to Cosworth uh, or to someone else uh, I went to Bernie Eccleston, bought a couple of DFEs, you could get a Hewer and Gearbox, uh, and it was much easier. And if you'd been successful, of course, you know, you'd have, when Bernie came along and made everybody millionaires, uh, you, you'd have been in the right place. Some people weren't. Um, but I'm pretty happy with what I did, and it, you had to choose. If we had gone Formula One, and I, the car didn't go to Frank, I kept it. 
And then we were asked uh, when we had Tiger, could we build a Formula One car? And uh, it was kind of, oh yeah, like, you know, here's the one I made earlier. <laughs> and so we got the thing up and there was going to be money from Holland for it. And then as these things happen, you know, you get so far down the line and then the money's not there. And a lot of people, as you'll note over, over time, when the money doesn't turn up, they bash on. But our attitude was, until the money's in the bank, just don't do it. But we would have had to shut down the whole production side if we were going to go and do Formula One. So, and I'm not sure we wanted to do that either. So you have to choose. And I probably made the right decision because if I'd, if I'd run the Formula One team, I'd have probably gone broke. Mm -hmm. So this was better, really. Uh, any other we're, questions? We're running out of time, so... Another question, anyone? Right over the far side. You would be, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> One last question. One last question. One last question. One last question. I'll let you off, Steve, okay? I do. Thank you. Hi, uh, Howden. You, you raced in the uh, British Grand Prix in 1973. Um, I believe you qualified sort of mid-pack. Uh, we obviously all know what happened on the end of the first lap. What are your recollections of getting through that carnage on that corner at Woodcote? Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, I was fairly lucky. I made a really good start. So I was, you know, I gained a number of positions. And I remember when we came through Woodcote, you know, in those days, it was flat out, nearly flat out. And as we came around, I could see Jody going on the grass. and I. I watched it going down the grass, kicking up all the stuff, a very dry day. And there was a slight breeze, and it started bringing the dust across the track as we went down there. So I flicked over to the pit wall, went down there, and then all of a sudden, there's, you know, Jody comes right back across the track. And I'd looked at going between him and the wall, but I thought, no, I'm going to fit through there. So I flicked around the back of it and went on. And then I looked in the mirror, and I saw Jackie X go between Jody and the wall. What I didn't can tell told me years later because it smashed the buses on us off and it rolled back. The track's not level, rolled back. Jackie fitted through there. So I think what happened was that anyone who was further back than me, they would they couldn't see because of the dust cloud that went across the track. So, you know, then people started running into each other and it just escalated. I remember going down Hangar Strait looking at the mirror and it seemed like there weren't enough cars coming. <laughs> they were. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, maybe one more question. Any more for any more? Well, okay. I've, got, yeah. I've got one last question for you. Which is, um, it, it's one of those awful desert island disc questions, but um, it, it's a way perhaps to wrap up this extraordinary career because you've worn so many different hats in your career, probably more than any other. Formula One driver I can think of, and the other things that you've done. So now from your vantage point, looking back all the way to that lad who came from New Zealand, which of all of the things that you've done has given you the most satisfaction? Oh, that's a real, uh, yeah, it is it all, that's goodness. Um, if I've got to choose one, can I have you've a chance? Oh, uh, dear. Um, it's like you've the one gramophone record you're allowed to hang on to. <laughs> but from marrying the perfect lady, um, I suppose, yeah, my for getting into Formula One because from when I went to Ardmore, just turned 14, I had no interest in, in racing. As you saw the early shot, I was a sailor, that was my thing. And I saw Prince Pierre in a 250F Mazda, Tony Gaze in a Ferrari, Peter White in a Ferrari and a young, promising chap called Jack Braden in a Cooper Russell. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. And of course everyone said, no, yeah, yeah, you'll grow out of it, don't you? Yeah, yeah you'll, you can do something else. And I thought, no, I'm going to be a Grand Prix driver. And the Are fact that I, that I actually got there, Brilliant. I suppose, gives me satisfaction. And there are a lot of little things that have been satisfying, you know, my role with the BRDC and sure. designing the cars and, and all of that stuff, you can go on and on. But, Oh, in, in the bigger, wider world, actually making it into Formula One. You made your goal. Great way to end. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you go?
just before we move on to the uh, auction and our world famous raffle for <laughs> a tin of WD-40, which still incidentally entitles you to win a free trip to New York, okay? <laughs> you have to win the can of WD-40. However, we'd like to present, this is an original piece of the 1907 track here, okay? It's been polished, it is yours to keep, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's very special because I have a great interest in the history of motor racing. Uh, I know that um, not everyone does, but I do. I love the whole history of it. And I like to think I'm a bit of a student of history, and so this is perfect. absolutely perfect. Thank you very, Thank you much, very much. Thank you Appreciate for being it. here. Incidentally, finally we've got Ace already, so hence the reason he's not got one this evening. So. <laughs> well polished. Well polished. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'm going to hand over to Tim to do the raffle, uh, the auction. That's brilliant. There we go. <laughs> no, you can do the raffle. Well, they put, a, they put, a, put a lot of gravel in it. 